All right, what's up everybody? The Nitrukberg here. Hope you've been doing well. Welcome to the fourth live stream. So I just quickly want to get some music going and then we'll dive right into it. So I hope you guys have all been having a good week or day. Uh, if you haven't, hopefully things get a bit better. And if you have, that's great. So um, I've got EVNG open already and we'll just be continuing on the lab we've been working on in the last three videos. So the Networkberg stream lab. So I'm just going to open this up and let's take a look and see what's happening. <laughs> so I'm just going to zoom out using Eve actually, instead of zooming in and out. And we did a few extra things last time. We spanned some VRFs. Uh, we brought some internet into the equation. And I think we also even set up some uh, EOIP, which was quite fun but let's just kick it up a notch and do a few more interesting things so first things first let's just start up our routers or all of our devices so i'll just quickly grab everything and i'll start them all so as soon as this boots up i know that this firewall i actually want to change out with an actual firewall i've got the 40 net images working now so we can put in a 40 net device unfortunately it's a 14 day trial so it's very limited towards the feature set we can use. We can't even use like the uh, UTM functionality on the 40 gate, unfortunately. Um, and what UTM is, it's basically just like uh, profile security profiles that allows you to filter traffic based on web filters or application filters. So not too much of a hassle though for what we're doing right now. We don't need that type of filtering, uh, but it is nice to have if you are uh, needing to provide stuff like web filtering towards your customers. But Mikrotik has some cool stuff like that as well. Well, not Mikrotik itself, but um, there are some other providers where you get like a script and then you connect to their servers and you can do some, it's kind of like web filtering, but not really. All right, the lab should be started. Let's just look at my status. That looks fine. We're not running out of resources, which is nice because Mikrotik is so uh, small when it comes to everything. All right. I need to quickly just set myself to uh, be right back again. Sorry, the stream isn't starting in five minutes. I just need to blank my screen out. So sorry about that. Just some uh, details I quickly need to hash out. All right, we're back. So we're just going to jump on this Mikrotik router. Um, but we're not going to jump on a router yet. We're just getting one box ready for when we do. Actually, let's, let's climb on this firewall. I wanna see what's happening here, but we can do this on the command prompt because I just wanna see what configs we've actually put on this device. So we could just quickly do an export. So let's do that. Um, let's do an export file name equals firewall backup and let's save that. And then what we can quickly do uh, let me just see if Ramon is enabled. Uh, tool Ramon export. It is enabled. Great. So what we can do is we could quickly just the uh, Winbox in and connect on Ramon. So let's jump on to. We should be able to get in there from the IXP. So admin blank. So we're connecting and I should see, I don't think I called it firewall. That's the only downside. Let's actually quickly disconnect. And on that micro tick, let's just quickly give it a name as well so that I can actually find it when I connect on Ramon. So system identity set name firewall, save that. And let's connect on Ramon again. And I should see a firewall. There we go. So let's connect on firewall. And then what I'm going to do is simply just download this uh, backup I made because this is going to make it really easy for me um, to look at all of the config. Before I get there, okay, cool. I've got it here firewall backup. So I'm just going to open this with notepad plus plus. I'll drag it here. So you see, it's very basic, the config we did. We added some VLANs, added some IP addresses. The DHCP was there by default. 
we added a masquerade rule and then some default gateway and ROM on. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward to replicate. So let's just turn this firewall off. But before I do that, let's just verify, do I have internet out? So let's jump onto, I think CPE 13 had some internet last time since we established that EOIP tunnel. So let's just see, can I ping 8.8.8.8? .8 yes, I can. So I can break out to Google's DNS servers. Um, 8.8.4.4, .4. yes, okay, so I'm happy. So I know there is actually internet on our ISP network to our customers. So we're gonna break that now. So <laughs> let's just uh, stop this firewall, delete this uh, little mister. See you in the next life. And boom, it's gone. Now let's add another node and add a 40 gates because I love 40 gates. Yeah, hello world. <laughs> hello world. Um, and Kristen, I, I might have uh, good news to you. I'll, I'll maybe switch some stuff up later on in the labs so we can look at your uh, per connection classifier. All right, let's get this 40 gate in production. We'll just call this our firewall. So on the bad note with 40 gate, they're very specific or fussy with what you can do with the trial devices. So you can only allocate, um, I think one gig of RAM, one CPU and four ports. So we, we can't really tweak these values, but that's fine. Uh, let's give it a nice firewall image as well. So let's find our C firewall and we can make it a nice blue or maybe red you know firewalls are red they're dangerous and let's save that so the reason i want to use a firewall is because firewalls are zone based they by default a firewall denies all traffic whereas a router just accepts all traffic so you kind of like need to tell a router hey um, i want to specifically block everything and then you need to allow this stuff. Uh, whereas with the firewall, it's already being blocked and you can just start allowing what you need to allow, which is actually what it's built for. Let's connect this firewall to our switch. So it can go to E01 on port one of the firewall. I'll save that. And then let's start this puppy up. Now this doesn't have to be a 40 gate. It could be a Palo Alto. It could be um, a Sonic wall, although in my head, the biggest contenders or the biggest firewall or the best firewall uh, people that you can get is 40 gate, Palo Alto. Palo Alto definitely is up there. And to an extent, the Cisco ASAs or firepower and that stuff, like that's really where it's at for the firewall landscape. I'm not going to say if you're using something else, it's bad. All firewalls do the same thing. But these are the vendors that are usually bringing something new or um, they're always thinking ahead of the curve how to make things better. So that's why I always follow them quite closely. Checkpoint's also good. Um, if you use Checkpoint, awesome. Um, but for me, I love FortiGate. I've always had a, um, well, I, I guess it's because I've worked generally on FortiGate devices, but really good stuff. All right, so let's get this FortiGate open. Credentials are default, which is admin blank, and then it's going to tell me, hey, you need to set a password. So I'll just make this the good old uh, p at ssw0rd, you know, the most secure password in the world. And now I'm in a 40 gate VM. So this will have all the functionality of a 40 gate, bearing it won't have any UTM, but we can do routing, BGP, SD WAN, even. Wow, we might actually play with that as well. I love SD WAN. Not as much as MPLS, but SD-WAN is very, it, it needs to kind of coexist with the future of networks. In my opinion, because people seem to, SD-WAN, some people say it's a buzzword, other people say it is the future. And in my opinion, it needs to coexist with MPLS technologies. Not everywhere in the world, is it's feasible to just get these massive, cheap bandwidth links. Um, and MPLS also gives you a certain degree of control over your network, whereas SD-WAN, you're relying on an underlay network. And if the underlay has issues, you don't have any control. So whatever QoS you have, it doesn't really do anything. So these things need to coexist and work together, similar to how um, 
cloud-based and on-premises infrastructure like um, server hosting needs to coexist. It needs to be a hybrid environment. Like I know everybody pushes, hey, we want to go to the cloud, but <laughs> we can't just all go to the cloud and we need to accept that. And it's fine. It's good. And it's good to understand that. All right, so back on point, let's do some stuff on the firewall. Let's just see show system interface. I'll just look at my interfaces. My port one is configured for DHCP and that we're going to change actually. So we're going to go config system interface. We're going to edit our port one. We're going to set the mode as static because we're assigning a static address. And then we can set our IP address to whatever the IP was on our <laughs> Mikrotik firewall. So, uh, wait, I can't just set the IP because we had that bound to a VLAN. So first we need to add some VLANs to be honest. All right, that's fine. Let me just end this config system interface. We're going to add some VLANs and we can call the VLAN something like, um, untrust. And then we need to set a few very specific values. See how much stuff I can set. This is crazy. Uh, the role we can set is LAN, set IP. Let's just set that so long. That will be uh, the 196.255.100.2 address. So let's just copy that from our config. Uh, set VLAN ID. And that was 99. And we need to set our interface, which is port one. Let's just do a show, see what we've configured. That looks fine to me. Let's just set some allow access as well. So this is kind of like the administrative things that you can say, hey, um, on this specific interface, what I'm allowing in from a management perspective. So I might allow ping, HTTP, HTTPS, Telnet and SSH, even though Telnet is very frowned upon as everybody knows. <laughs> so now we've got our allow access, we've got an IP, we know it's on the LAN. Well, we can actually set the role to WAN, to be honest. And port one, which is correct, and the VLAN ID. So that's fine, let's just next. Oh, crud, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, let's just edit untrust again, and then I need to basically add all of these details again. So the set IP, set allow access, because 40 gates also work on what we call a VDOM or a virtual domain. And by default, you have a virtual domain called your root, which is where all of your um, devices speak on. But you could break your 40 gate up into different VDOMs, different virtual domains. So think of that almost as a VRF on the 40 gate, but it's not a VRF really. It's where you create virtual 40 gates inside the 40 gate. So you could essentially have one big physical device and you could create different VDOMs for either different customers or VRFs. And it makes so much sense when you actually get into it. So let's just set our VDOM as well as root. And let's show, I think that should be it. That's fine. I go next, no errors, I end it. So let's quickly see if I do an execute ping, which is unfortunate because on a 40 gauge, you need to always say execute ping, uh, almost like VDC on a Nexus. So on the Nexus switch, I don't really work with any hey, network, network brute. Oh man, I, I butcher that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I don't often work on Nexus. Um, so I'm not totally sure what, what VDC is. I am aware of VPC, uh, where you bind like, uh, but, but I'm sure it's like virtual domain, maybe the C's for controller. Let's just execute the ping, see if I can get to 169.255.100.1. Cool, so I've got breakout. So all that I'm gonna do now is just add a static round. So, Um, for router OS version seven, uh, beta four, I typically try and stay away from the beta versions because there's cool functions and features that they bring out on Mikrotik, specifically like the VXLAN, the updates to BGP with multi-core support, um, 
WireGuard, stuff like that is there on the version 7, but I typically don't uh, even touch user man on Winbox when it comes to version 7. Maybe I could do that on the lab and we can figure it out, but I haven't done that before. All right, so I just want to add my static root. So we're going to go config router static. I'll edit zero. So in FortiGate, what's nice is whenever you edit zero, it just adds a new entry. So I can set the destination as zero, 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 slash zero. I can set my gateway as 169.255. That makes sense actually, Network Brew. Um, if I think about it, there's a thing on the catalysts, not the Nexus I've worked with that, that was kind of similar, but it basically, no, it, it's not similar. I, I, I think I'm thinking about something completely different. So what I'm thinking about was it, it's, it's like IRF, but it, was, uh, it wasn't called that. Um, but it's also essentially where you take two physical stacks and you just kind of meld them into one log like logical brain and then both devices kind of operate on the same physical layer and that that's pretty cool so you kind of like take two ports patch them into each other and they just make one switch so it's not stacking because you can stack at the back you've got your stacking cables and whatever but this is a little bit uh different if i remember the name i'll bring it up just now maybe i'll even lab that as well let me just add this gateway before I forget. <laughs> so set device port. No, our device is the untrust. And then I can next end. So if I now do a ping to Google, I've got breakout. My question is, no, it's not stack wise. Um, VSS, that was the word I was looking for. VSS. VSS. But I haven't done that in, in years now, but that was pretty fun when I when I did play around with it. Let's just see, does our customer have any breakout now? I highly doubt it. I think they're going to not have any breakout. So if I do a ping, no, I don't have breakout. Reason being is on my firewall, I haven't um, specified any routes back and I haven't set up my vrf vlan shit so i'll do that in a bit i just quickly want to get to the 40 gate on the gui so let's do that by maybe <laughs> this might be weird uh, but i might add a static route from my actual computer um, to my fake network my emulated network to get there because i should have a public ip which isn't mine but I should be able to get there. One six nine two five five zero one hundred dot one and dot two, and I can't ping it because I don't have any routing for it yet. So let's just quickly add some routes. Route add minus p. My destination is one six nine two five five one hundred zero. My mask is two five five two five five two five five zero, and my gateway will be this ixp now because this should know how to get to this public address of the firewall. So let me just quickly drag that out through Winbox. So IXP, hello, mister, I'm just going to connect to you. And then I want to look at you. What is your IP address? Because you're getting that on the HTTP. Although I saw it, I, I, I'm pretty blind, aren't I? <laughs> so there is 74.135. So I'll just add that as my gateway. Uh, Okay, so the route already exists. So it seems like I must have fiddled around with this somewhere. So route print, let's just see 169.255.100.star. star. All right, so I do have a route for this. So if I actually do a trace route, what happens to this? 169.255. Oh, what am I doing? It's 169.255.100.2. And let's just minus D that because we don't want to resolve any host names. So it goes to the router and then that's where it ends. But I think it's because my actual LAN adapter 
this network doesn't know how to get back to. So I might do something very unorthodox quickly just to get onto that firewall. I'm going to connect another LAN cable. Okay, that looks weird. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, let's just quickly refresh our topology. And then I'll just add another node for my actual, well, not a node, we're going to add a network. It's going to be our management. And I'm just going to bring that into the 40 gate so that I can just quickly access this. So I don't struggle around with some routing, uh, which is actually uh, inconsequential. So let's just connect that onto port four quickly. And then what I'll do is on the firewall, I'll just quickly assign this an address in my management range. So admin, oh, I'm already on config system int, uh, edit port four is what I patched. Let's set, because if I do a show, it's already set to the default, which is static. So I can just set an IP and that should be 192.168.74. Which is my Eve network. And let's maybe make this dot one twenty four. I don't know why. It just popped into my head. Let's next and end this. And if I do an execute ping one nine two one six eight seventy four dot two, I get a response. So I should be able to get there from my browser now. So let's just throw this puppy into a browser. Unfortunately, I can't use HTTPS uh, to connect. Uh, I know why that's failing as well. What is my actual LAN range? I just quickly want to see. So IP address, IP config, 192.168.1.0. Okay, let's do that. Config router static. Mm, edit zero. Set destination is 192.168.1.0 slash 24. <laughs> um, set gateway is 192.168.74.2 and then set device is port four now next and let me see can i get there now apparently not so this is weird let's just try something by just changing the default route but this is not the end result so welcome to the wonderful world of troubleshooting and figuring stuff out so let me just see what routes I have. I've got an edit one. So I'm just going to update this to port four. And let's just set the gateway to 192.168.74.2. Uh, let's end that. And let's see, can I get there now? Execute ping. This is really weird. I'm actually expecting this to work now. Can get there. I can get to my Eve, but I can't get to dot one, which is actually the adapter on my computer. Huh. I'm just quickly going to delete that interface. But I know for a fact it's working because I can get to the internet from the device huh very peculiar though i need to just change those routes again config router static show edit one set gateway 169 255 100 dot 1 set device untrust uh, next end, let's see, can I ping out? 
So I get breakout. Uh, let's just see. If I try and connect to it from CMD, I know the traffic gets to my IXP. So let's just see what is actually happening from the IXP. I still have a window open here. So I'm just going to run a continuous ping quickly from command prompt to 169.255.100.2. So that continuous ping I should pick up in my interfaces. So there's ether one, let's just do a torch. So what do I see connecting to that IP actually? 192.168. 74.1, I'm pretty sure you all saw that. So there is the connection. Well, it's not that one because that's actually connecting to something else. That's actually the Mikrotik connection. There's the connection. So it's definitely trying to get there. I wonder if it's something with the lab and the um, Eve itself. Let's try and tweak around a little bit. So our default route is fine. <laughs> this is gonna be something so simple again, or it's just going to be a case of me needing to reboot some um, devices on Eve. But I know that I've got connectivity out from the firewall, so it should in theory be working. Uh, let's just see from the IXP. Can I actually ping 169.255.100.2? I can get there. So if I can get there from the IXP, there's no reason for this not to work. Uh, let me just check some details on the firewall again. Do I still have it open on Putty? Yes, I do. So show system int port one. We are allowing ping HTTPS. Let me see, can I ping it? If I can ping it, then it should work, but I don't think I can ping it. No, I can't. So even ping is failing. I wonder, I just quickly want to jump on my Eve server and see route Eve. Can I ping my adapter from Eve 16874.1? Ping 192.168.74.128. Okay, I can ping Eve from my actual PC. Very interesting. Okay, but this dot two is an interface that's just bound on Eve itself. I really want to get to the bottom of this because I know for a fact everything should be working because if I maybe, let's look at router seven. Because I know router seven has a public IP as well. Admin password, admin blank, IP address print because we had the 169.255.0.2 address. So let's just add a default route for that as well quickly. Route add uh, minus P zero zero mask 255.255.255.252. And let's just make the um, gateway 192.168.74.135. Sorry, I don't have it on the screen. So let's just try and ping 169.255.0.2. Man, this is actually, I can ping 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 is the interface that's bound on router one. So actually there's definitely something wrong between the IXP and getting to my ISP networks from outside. We'll figure it out just now. Um, my lab specs, so I am using, I don't wanna say a state-of-the-art computer because it's not state-of-the-art, it's just a gaming computer. 
uh, but I do have 32 gig of RAM in the machine. And as you know, this Micro 6 actually has small sizes. So you're using like 256 uh, meg of RAM as a, as a baseline. So you could increase it obviously just to do more stuff. But since I'm doing very little in the labs, uh, 256 is just fine for me. So if I looked at my, um, I think it's the status, you can see how much memory and CPU and stuff I'm using in EVE. So I'm also running six cores, although I have run with 12 uh, vCPUs, but I'm just using six at the moment because I feel more comfortable and I've seen some weird stuff prop up when I'm using 12. So I'm leaving it at six, it seems stable. And then uh, again, 28 gig of memory because I've got 32 gig available on my actual system and I don't want to over, um, assign RAM so that my actual system starts running slow. But I've got plenty of resources available at the moment. Cisco chows a lot of resources. So if you were trying to lab like those Nexus switches, those devices are so hungry for resources. Um, I think as a baseline, one of them is using four gig of RAM and <laughs> you'll get out of uh, resources pretty quickly. Okay. but. Now it feels like I haven't accomplished anything yet and I, I really want to. So let's figure it out. So from the IXP, I know I can get to the dot one from my actual network. So if I was to go onto Winbox and if I connect it to 169.255.0.1 um, with admin blank, I can connect to the Mikrotik. So I know from my network, I can get to IXP, but then from my IXP, when it gets to the ISP network, we're starting to have some issues. Alrighty, so I just want to see on router seven, is there anything weird happening there? It might actually be that I'm natting some sort of traffic there. Um, and that could potentially be causing some issues. So let's just check that theory IP nat IP firewall nat print, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's kind of understanding that I'm natting traffic out to the internet. So ether 10 is where I've got that on and I'm actually not natting anything here. So that's fine. Hmm. How about let's just connect onto Ramon for router seven and have a look on some things there. So let's get onto our router seven, which is our ASBR. Yeah, network bro. That <laughs> I've done that before on my work laptop. I, I've also tried adding like a Nexus switch and then it was really struggling. Let's check here. Uh on my router seven, what does my routing look like? We just want to have a look at our main routing table. So we're getting that thrown there. So we are learning a default route. And we should have the 169.255.100.0 as a connected route. So that's also fine. Let's actually try something and not on router seven. I want to go to the IXP and just for interest sake, I'm just going to disable my NAT rule that I know that I've got configured on ether one that goes to the internet, because I think what's happening as well is traffic is leaving over the ether one. And then it's being natted out as an address. So let's just disable that for now. And let's see if I ping dot two, I can't get there. So it's definitely not the NAT. So we can put the back on. I know the traffic is coming in on ether one. Let's see, is it actually leaving on ether two? So ether two goes to my ISP. So let's quickly see there. Let's torch that traffic and see what's happening. So if I just run a ping again, let's just run it as continuous uh, minus T. And what do we pick up? 
can I actually see that connection or not? Let me just increase the entry timeout. So the entry stay a bit longer. So no, it's not that. There we go. I can see the traffic. This is so freaky now. Okay, before I lose my head, um, I'm just going to add another 40 gate quickly because I'm <laughs> I'm literally losing my head now. Um, yeah, let's just bring this up base stats. I'm not going to add any picture. I just want to get it up and running quickly. Start it there. Connect it onto the network adapter again. So let's just see here. I just want to open this up, watch it boot. So there is our fake serial number. So again, this is just a trial license. It just generated that so that it can tell uh, for the 40 guard or 40 gate servers. Hey guys, this is the serial number. Should I decide to move this from trial to um, an actual product? Show system int. So port one currently has DHCP. So let's just do a get system int, get system int. And I should see on port one, there is an IP 74.140. Can I get to that? And I can't. And it's actually starting to annoy me now. And I don't know if I need to restart my EVE lab. Let's quickly do that, actually. I'm just going to shut down all my nodes. So let's stop them. And as soon as they've stopped, it looks like they're busy stopping. Yes, they are. They're busy turning gray. Let me just uh, refresh my topology. All of them look good and gray. So let's close the lab. And let me just check. I think I had a 40 net lab open here as well. Let's just make sure this isn't running anything. All right, these things are down. All right, so I'm just quickly going to reboot my Eve. So bear with me. Uh, system or shutdown minus H. Now I could do a reboot minus H now, but I sometimes find that with Eve, um, when you do just a reboot and it comes back, some of the issues you had before the reboot are still there. But when you start it up from fresh, that seems to sort it out. So let's load this up. So if you're using Chrome, I would actually recommend not using Chrome when you're using Eve and G. Uh, I would rather say use Firefox. I've had issues in Chrome, uh, specifically like where you want to get into the node and then it asks you what application do you want to use, but it doesn't actually prompt you for an application. Uh, sorry, I logged in with the wrong details there. So it's root and Eve. Let's just see, can I ping out? Yes, I can. Uh, let's just reconnect onto Eve. Onto eight. And I, I've got a feeling that Eve is going to not play along now. <laughs> Let's try this. 192.168.74.128. Come on, Eve. Why are you being difficult now? Let me try and open from Chrome. Let's just try and do some pings out. And I swear I get this sometimes with emulators. And it's, it's even... It's on any emulator, it's on viral, it's on GNS, it's on anything you can think of. Like I, I have no idea, but it's it's better than buying physical equipment. I can definitely tell you that. There's no way I can spend thousands and thousands of, let's say dollars on physical lab equipment. You could buy some cheap stuff, but when it comes to like a firewall, if you wanna get a firewall license, that's already a few thousand dollars. It's it's not feasible. It's not feasible. Okay, let's open up our stream lab again. 
and then I'm not going to start up all the nodes. I'm just going to start up this firewall that I connected to my management network so that we can see if we can actually connect to the thing. Because if I can connect to it, then I'll feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, hi. <laughs> All right, so device is starting up again. So let's see, let's log in as soon as it prompts me. So we've got admin. Ooh, I did set the password to the good old p at. In we go. Let's just see get system interface. And I've got a port one and it's still got 140 as the IP. Let's try and connect. Still doesn't want to connect. HTTP. This is frustrating me because <laughs> I know these images work because I've played around in a different lab on them. Um, let's just see if that lab actually still works. Let me close it, go into this 4D net lab and open this up. So let's just start this on the left hand side. And this was just to test some stuff with um, SD1 to see if it actually works and it does. Now let's see what IP address does this 40 gate have? Oh, but I still need to wait for it to load up. Sorry guys. Not I envisioned the stream to start. I actually thought we we're just going to import a fire one. Everything's going to work perfectly. But hey, that is IT for you. Nothing works perfectly. And you always need to adapt and plan around everything. <laughs> uh, get uh, system interface int. So let's just see, there's 192.168.74.90. Can I open that? That I can open. Oh, <laughs> I'm actually getting so angry now because I know for a fact I haven't messed up anything in the configuration. So I don't know if there's maybe some incompatibility with uh, the Eve lab that I've set up in the network stream and with these devices. Because here I see it's working just fine and I haven't added any special config. It's just running as is. Hmm. Um, so router three in this topology, that is a Cisco router that I've added and it's very base setup. It's literally just an IP and it's got a very basic NAT rule to get out to the internet, uh, but it is Cisco IOL. Uh, so it's like a Linux image of Cisco, but it, it's literally just here so that, um, there's an interface going out to the internet and then there's an interface that goes to my 40 gate device to give access. So now we've got a Cisco, a micro tick at the top, and then the 40, the 40 gate also had direct internet out to the internet. So that was amazing. And it was fun testing the SD WAN. Um, I don't know, maybe I could <laughs> not again, not what I wanted to show guys, but let, let's just quickly show you it regardless. So in this topology, I've just got a Docker connected to the 40 gate. Imagine that's my LAN network. And I want you to imagine we had three different ISPs and these three ISPs, they're providing us some bandwidth and direct internet access, and we can break out from the site. Now, SD-WAN, um, it has so many different meanings for so many different vendors. But for me, what SD-WAN is, and it's not just a buzzword, it is a mechanism that becomes application aware. So with stuff like QoS, where you look at ports or source and destination addresses and stuff like that, um, so that you could queue packets or prioritize certain packets or bandwidth. Um, with SD-WAN, it becomes aware of what the actual application is, if it's Azure or if it's browsing or if it's Telnet even or whatever, but it, it, it knows what the application is and then you could basically uh, prioritize stuff over links through your, for your applications over your links. 
Now, 40 gates SD WAN is actually pretty straightforward. All that we get is we have SD WAN zones, and you could imagine this as the interfaces, a virtual interface where you assign your ports to. So in, in my topology, I've just got the basic virtual WAN link, which is where I've got my ISP links just bundled up together. But what we could do is we could create a new zone and the zone we could essentially call something maybe like our MPLS zone. And I don't have any members to add to it just yet, but if there were available ports open, like let's say there was another port open and that actually came into my MPLS, I could assign that port as a member to that MPLS zone. And I could specify what the gateway is and what the cost is associated with it. And what's nice is if I maybe had an IPsec tunnel running from this 40 gate to my data center, I could also bundle this with the MPLS traffic so that if my MPLS link ever went off and I had services that I had to get to in the data center, I could essentially still get to it over the IPsec tunnel via this virtual MPLS interface. Now I'm just going to delete this interface because we've got sd -WAN already configured with just the three internet ports and that's how easy it is to configure sd -WAN, guys, we can move on. <laughs> um, so Glenn Papa, you can get the software images from, e, uh, from Fortinet's website on the support site, uh, similar to Cisco or Juniper or whoever. Um, there is a place if you are a partner to download the software images from. And if you want to download images from somewhere else on Google, that's that's up to you. But the images are available online. You just need to look for them. Okay, I just quickly want to go on with the SD-WAN stuff. So we've got a zone, which is basically just a virtual interface. Then we have SD-WAN rules and performance SLAs. Now, the SD-WAN rules is actually what happens like what traffic it's looking at. So here I've just got a basic rule. It's the first rule. I've called it LAN and I've said anything from this specific source address going to anywhere on the internet. And then we've got some criteria that can be matched. Now this is where stuff gets interesting with the SD-WAN. So we, we get um, different, uh, they like to call them algorithms, but things that you can do with the SD-WAN. So you could do stuff like best quality or lowest cost or maximize bandwidth so i like this maximize bandwidth because what this is essentially doing is load balancing it's bundling your three interfaces together almost like one big physical interface and then you just get more bandwidth out but it, it doesn't mean you get more bandwidth it just means all three of your interfaces are being utilized instead of just one link at a time where you're waiting for a failover scenario to occur but if you use base quality what happens is it will prioritize uh, the links in the order that you specify them. And then we can set stuff like the measured SLA. So that is wh what we configure in the performance SLA. So there I've got a very basic uh, thing I've called ping SLA. So Google's, DN or Google's DNS is always being pinged. And here we can see some of those nice stats for the SD-WAN to see if any of the SLA is being breached. So you've got your packet loss, latency, and jitter. And you can add more like stuff, but those are the typical values that you want to be monitoring. And if a value is breached, uh, if I go to my SD-WAN zones, when I open this up, uh, actually not there, the SD-WAN rules, you'll see these members have these check marks. So these are members that are active. If I change to base quality and my measured SLA is again the ping SLA, I can say okay. So let's just look at that ping SLA again, but look at the WAN rules. You'll see which port is being, uh, it, it was port one just now, but port one is also pretty high on um, latency if I saw correctly. So that's why I chose port two. If we go to our performance SLAs, if we look at the performance, there we see what the latencies look like. And if I open this up, we can set what the SLA targets are. So I might just take the jet away set the latency to 200. So any link that exceeds 200 milliseconds latency, it will then find the next best link. And this update static route is just basically where it chooses the next best member and it disables the old static route. So let's just quickly emulate that by, and this is again a cool feature on even G Pro. You'll see port two is currently the active member. So I'll go into Pro. So I'll find port two. 
which is going to my router 3. So this link between router 3 and the internet, you see I'm not even doing this on port 2. I'm just going to edit the quality and make the latency really bad. So let's make it like 400 ms. If I apply that and I go back onto the 40 gate and I just refresh the SD-WAN rules, you'll see port 3 has now become the active state. And if I actually went on to um, Eve, let's just jump back there, go into the stalker. If I run a continuous ping, and also Glenn, one thing, I, there is a video on, on this channel here that shows you how to upload 14 images if you do have the image. Um, so I'll put a link in the description for that afterwards. Is this Docker connecting? I think I didn't click something, so let's just open it again. Connect. Hmm. All right, so I wanna show you how seamless the SD-WAN is actually. So what I could do is I could run a ping to, let's not do Google's DNA server, let's just do www.google.com. And you can see there what my responses and how my packet loss looks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the internet quickly. So it's now going over port three, which is the Mikrotik. So let's disable that link or suspend it. Let's just go back here, see what happens. Getting some timeouts and it should come back up. There we go. So we dropped a couple of packets and if I go to the 40 gate and I look at my SD-WAN rules, just refresh that, it's either going to be port one or two. So it is choosing port one because port two still has that insane latency on it. If I make the latency on port one, maybe let's say 600, which is really bad. It's like working on satellite, but hey, 600 is still respectable if you're like in the middle of nowhere. Let's say you're on a farm, you've got a satellite connection, that's actually really good. But if if you're on a fiber connection, you know when you've got 600 milliseconds latency. But my 40 gate might feel a bit weird now because I've just tweaked the latency on the port that I was coming in. I might actually just take that away. So let's take this latency and jitter away on port one. Let's unsuspend that other link and let's make sure that this last link with the Cisco also doesn't have any latency. All right, we look good. I just want to go back onto the 40 gate because what I really enjoy is the load balancing. Reason being when we're load balancing, again, we're utilizing all of our links at the same time, which makes it very, very nice for us because if we're um, so Bogdan, let me just read your question. Would it choose port two if port one would fail, even if port two has so the 40 gate uses an algorithm to just check which links are the best. So let's say even if both links, both ports, port three and port two dropped. Uh, it would then choose port one still, but let's say port two and one is still active, but port three is down or dead, then it would see which one has the better latency and then it would route traffic over that link. That's just what the algorithm or the best quality does for us. Now, what the load balancing does is it will now utilize all of our links and bundle them together, but it can have negative effects as well because well, not really, because the cool thing is with SD-WAN, let's say if ISP2 was having a lot of latency, it would still prioritize pushing, pushing the traffic over port 3 and port 1. Um, let's just quickly emulate by going onto that Docker, and then I'll just quickly go to YouTube on it. So let me close that, open up the Firefox on the browser and go to YouTube and let's start a bunch of different streams because our users love going to YouTube and consuming bandwidth by watching HD videos. You know, um, I'm not really gonna listen to anything. Let me just make sure everything's muted else this video will get copyright uh, struck and then I will be very sad. All right. So I'm just gonna leave that in the background. And if we go back onto our 40 gate, if I look at my interfaces, 
actually we won't see it here let's go into our sd-wan zones if i open this up i can actually see how much bandwidth is being pushed and well pushed and received over the interfaces so they're actually being load balanced now and you can sort this by bandwidth volume or sessions so we've got the equal amount of sessions but the bandwidth is a bit different but it could be uh, just different streaming happening but the load balancing is working like that's the cool bit and this all comes in effect from the rules we've defined on well the performance sla with the rules and then on our sd-wan virtual interface and now comes the cool part the firewall policies which is what we actually wanted to test on our other topology what we're going to try and fix now um, you just specify your out interface as the sd-wan interface now instead of just any one port it would be your virtual wan link or your sd-wan interface and now you can set what traffic you're allowing so again this is why firewalls are so good in isp environments specifically but even for clients everything's zone based interfaces are their own zones and you can now set stuff like from this port to this port allow or block it um, whereas with the router everything goes okay so i'm going to close this 40 gate we're going to shut this lab down because i know everything works but <laughs> it doesn't so i want to go back onto my stream lab and we're either going to fix the firewall or we're just going to add a few more different services and things to have some fun but let's just bring this firewall back up Maybe it just needed a, a good old restart. So let's just open this up and see what is this device doing? What are you telling me? What are you telling me? We've got a serial number. And then you're gonna tell me you're loading and then we're gonna log in and everything's gonna work isn't that amazing wishful thinking get system int in uh, interface find our port 2 and it's still 140 so if i grab 140 and i try and open it it's still failing and this is frustrating the living stuff out of me because I know it should work. With the static. Uh, let's just add a static route. Maybe that is my issue. So config router static. Edit zero. Um, set gateway. We can make that 192.168.74.2. And then we can set our device is port one next and let's see maybe i can access it now can i come on let's do a drum roll no it doesn't like that either or either hey hey what what is this <laughs> why can't i ping 169.255.0.2 now can i get there i'm going to be running around circles tonight guys uh, this is uh, not how things should be working I haven't changed anything on this lab so how am I pinging that can I still ping it oh but that is the um, router 2's IP let's try 100.2 Oh, but I haven't started that firewall yet. No, no, I don't even have the router on. How is it pinging? Guys, <laughs> what is this? This is magic. No, this is Sparta. Wait, I don't want to get copyright claimed. Scratch that, I didn't say that. I actually watched the, that movie on Netflix recently. I don't know why. I like it. admin password execute ping 888 
Ooh, it doesn't like that. But I think it's because the BGP between our routers hasn't started up yet. And I'm actually pretty sure that let's just start up these devices. So everything in the ISP one, let's just start you guys. And let's see. I'm still pretty freaked out why why I can ping that IP now. Because that should be the IP address of router 7 on its WAN interface, which I couldn't get to earlier. Um, let's try and connect to that. 169.255.0.2. Let's disable the ROM on. Uh, I actually think I'm pinging out to the internet with that. 169.255.0.2. And I don't think I've got routes. No, I do. What the heck, dude? Uh, yeah, I did switch it on. It's, it's hiding behind this cloud, but I did switch it on. That's why I did this whole big selection. So let's just hide it again, make it look nice. Man, this is annoying me so much. All right, let me just delete this other 48. And we need to delete that network address or network adapter. We don't need that anymore. I'm also just going to delete this management network. Want to keep the ISP2 here. Um, so let me just see. Admin. Oh, let's see. Execute ping. Can I ping out yet? Yes, I can. Uh, execute trace. So that looks normal. That looks normal. So that IPI hijacked from somebody, not not nice of me, but this is just for demonstration. Seventy four dot two, which is normal, and then it should actually go to over my normal internet. Oh, sorry, I'm just moving up a bit, getting a little bit more comfortable. There we go, more comfortable. Close that. So let's go back to the CMD. See, can I ping one double zero dot two? Show system interface. One six nine two five five one double zero dot two. I'm allowing ping HTTPS. So this is all normal. Static configure router static. Let's just delete two because we're not going to use that. Uh, next and end. Uh, execute ping. Hmm. One six nine two five five. One double zero dot two. And I know for a fact if I go into this. Um, Let's go into router seven quickly. Oh, I didn't want to connect there. So connect onto the Roman, find router seven. <laughs> that's true. No, that's true. It's like, um, I don't know if, if you've watched anime before, but it's like um, Death Note with L 
and then he like it's this character that sits with his legs on top of the seats and he drinks like a lot of coffee and eats sugar and whatever just to focus better it reminds me of that okay so i just want to check here am i actually seeing the traffic on router 7 and i want to look do i see it on the untrust interface so let's just torch that and let's just increase that timer and let's see what's happening am i picking up that traffic or not uh, am i even running in the ping still let's do that 169.255.100.2 Let's just see, uh, I've got something here, but that's DNS. So I'm not seeing the traffic there. And Ether 10 is where the traffic should be coming in. So let's just torch that interface. I can see it coming in on Ether 10. I wonder, I wonder, let's go into our main routing table. So I don't have any routes for uh, <laughs> what is that? Ether three. Ether three. No, uh, guys, I'm really angry at myself now. Let's just see if this is actually the case. So there's an IP address one nine two one six eight seventy four one hundred, which is the same range is on my management. So it will actually try and send the traffic over ether three because that's a directly connected route. So let's disable the sucker and let's see what happens. If I can get to this now. Oh my goodness, guys, we did it. We've got liftoff. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> we did it <laughs> only in an hour. <laughs> uh. But do you see how easy it is to make such a rookie mistake? I think um, that Ether3, we were connecting somehow directly to the management interface at some point, And now it came to bite us back in the behind because we never removed that IP address. Awesome. So the firewall actually does work and we can actually start the, <laughs> start the lab now. Let's do it. <laughs> Oh my lord. All right. So now we've got a 48 and we have a firewall that we can actually configure for our ISP network. So let's do some of that. So we've got a port one. I've been, I've configured this untrust VLAN on it. Now we just need to replicate some of the other config. Um, that being, we want to add these VLANs for our fiber and wireless customers so that we can restore internet to them because we broke their internet. We just caused an outage of one hour. It's unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> it's like that. Um, I hope I don't get into trouble, but, uh, hang on. Um, let me just pause the song quickly. I don't know if you guys know adventure time, uh, but there's this lemon character and then he, he like does this. Uh, he, <laughs> I don't know if, if you if you know this. <laughs> so that's how I feel about what happened there. That was pretty uh, unacceptable. <laughs> All right, now let's do it. Let's do it. Let's add some VLAN. So I'm just going to create a new interface. It will be a VLAN. We're going to call this the same as we had it on our Micritic. So let's make it VRF Fiber Customers. 
the VLAN ID is 201. We're not going to put this in a, in a different VRF or anything. There is cases where you will use VRF on your 40 gates, but not for what we're doing here. Uh, it looks like this is maybe too long, so let's just make this cust. And the interface is going to be port 1. Oh, that feels bad. I'm sorry. That's bad, dude. All right. Our VRF, we can put the, or the role we can set as LAN. Let's assign our IP address. So this is 10.254.255.10 slash 29. And I'll just enable ping. And what's nice is we can create address object, but it's not that relevant. And let's apply. So now we have a VLAN interface on the firewall for our fiber customers. Similar as on the interface of the Mikrotik we had before that was doing this. So let's just create another interface uh, called this VRF wireless cust. Uh, let's just make the wireless maybe a bit smaller. Let's call this WRL. VLAN ID for them was 200. Uh, I'm trying to put that in the interface. So our VLAN is 200. Interface is still port 1. Let's set our IP address to 10. 255, 10.254.255.2.29 and let's just enable ping again. So will internet work now? I have a suspicion it will not and it's, it's nothing to do with the routing or the interfaces. This now more or less has to do with something else. So if I go into EVE and I go to this uh, CPE 13, which I know worked earlier. If I run a ping, oh, let me start the music up again. Admin, and sorry, the music, maybe you guys are listening, but it's, it's more for me just to, I, I like working with music. I, I don't know how you guys feel about it, if you work with music or not. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, maybe you find it distracting. Um, maybe it helps you it, it puts me in the zone at least it helps me focus a lot better so let's look at our system or no, not system we're just going to do a ping so we're doing a ping and it's failing and if i do a trace or tool trace route trace route to 8.8.8.8 .8 what is happening bunch of timeouts but this is mostly because of the MPLS we're running. So I'm just going to go into the firewall and then I'm going to show you what I think the issue is. When we go to our policies um, or on our old config, we've added the IP addresses, we've added the interfaces, but have we added or missed something? Um, there's a static route to the internet as well. Now what I think we've missed is we've missed two configs that I can see, one being this um, route for that customer's EOIP tunnel that we established. So let's just quickly add that as well. So let's go into our network, static routes, let's add one. And the route is 169.255.101.0 slash 30. And our gateway is to the fiber customers. And this will be going to fiber customer. Okay, so we've got routes. What we don't have is we don't have any natting set up. So the firewall before was just natting all traffic going out of the untrust interface. Now, our firewall will be handling the, the actual firewall. So we'll just create a policy and we'll call this fiber cast internet. Our incoming interface will be the fiber VRF, which we've configured, and our outgoing interface will be our untrust. So this is now zone-based where we're specifying what can go in and what can go out of the network. Otherwise, everything else is being dropped. Our source, um, we should actually specify this as the link addresses that we configured, which is the 
201 and also this 169255 IP. So let's just maybe add that because we don't want to be lazy. You can be lazy and put it as all, but what's going to happen to you if you're lazy is one day that laziness is going to come back and bite you like that uh, local address that I had on the router. And if it comes back and bite you and those people biting you will probably be auditors because they're going to say, okay, we're going to audit your firewall infrastructure. And why do you have rules that's allowing traffic from everywhere? Because this is very risky business. This means if a hacker was in some other pool um, and your firewall just allows it, that's very bad. So always try and set the destination or the sources and destinations. Destinations is a bit different for internet because your internet will always be all because <laughs> the internet has so many IPs. So you can't really just put them in a destination that's your, you, you can, but your firewall is going to suffer a little bit. Okay, so let's quickly just add these addresses. So we've got this address. So I'm just going to copy paste actually. And this is nice in the 40 gate. You can just put the addresses here. It will find there's no entry. And then we can just quickly add it. So I'll add it there. And then we have a few more link addresses like this uh, 10 slash 30. And those might be some additional routes we want to set up as well. But I'll, I'll show you everything in a sec why, like what the reasoning is. I'm not adding them yet. I actually want to define something that we call a group or an address group. So instead of on the policy, putting each address in individually, we're going to assign all of the addresses into an address group. And then we'll just assign the address group to the policy. Uh, let me close that. I don't know why that's open. That's actually confusing me the whole time. So let's create another address. And there we go. So now what we want to do is add an address group. So we can click create go address group. And this is just like the quick pain to do everything. You could do this from this address box as well, which I'll go to now. Um, but I just want to first add the policy. So let's add an address group again. And let's call this fiber customer ranges. And then our members will be all of these new ranges that we added. And I can give them different color if I want to maybe make them a nice light grayish blue color silver maybe even and let's apply that so now i've got a group called fiber customer ranges i can add it there or i could have added them all individually but i just want to add the group our destination is all and our service now this is where firewalls are also pretty important so if you put it as all again this is a risk because people could essentially be going torrenting or going to sites and stuff that you don't really want but it is the internet. Maybe these people are paying for services such as torrenting. So you could leave it as all, or you could define uh, P2P ports or traffic, but I'm going to put this on all just for this. Our action will be accept. We're using this as flow based and we're going to NAT the traffic out. And what we're going to NAT the traffic out is use outgoing interface address. So this is basically masquerade. So it's going to, Masquerade the IP address as 169.255.100.2 for any traffic leaving the network. I'm not going to enable any of the UTM functions. So these security profiles, this you can enable if you have a valid license, but I don't, this is a trial. So none of this stuff works. Let's log our sessions. And here's a nice thing. You can also capture packets, which would essentially create a PCAP file, which you could analyze using Wireshark or, or whatnot. Okay. Let's add that policy and let's quickly see, do I have breakout now? So there's a CP 13. Let's try and ping 8.8.8. <laughs> we did it. So now we have internet access out, which is perfect. And I mean, I think the fiber customers was just this CPE. Let's quickly see, does 
these bottom people have access, which was our wireless customers. So if I go admin blank, if I ping 8.8.8.8, .8 will anything work? No, it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Well, because we haven't defined a policy for it yet. We've added the interface for our wireless customers, but there's no policy that allows traffic from the wireless VRF or the wireless link out to the internet. So let's quickly add that as well. And this we can do super quickly by just copying the policy. And I, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna sort by sequence. This is uh, easier for me as well. So firewalls typically also work in sequence, just like on the Mikrotik, it reads rules from top to bottom. So let's call this, and this is also nice on the 40 gate. We can change values in the policies from here. We don't need to create the new policy. So we could give it the name from here. We could call this wireless cust internet. Apply it. Our from interface, so traffic will now be coming from the wireless customers, not the fiber customers. This is also still going to the untrust. Oof. Now that I think about it, this fiber customer ranges is incorrect because we only have this 169.255.1010 slash 30 configured for the fiber customer. So let's just update that. And the source address for fiber customers, let's actually edit this, remove that fiber customer range, and let's just call this wireless customer ranges. Cool. <laughs> How easy was that to do? And our destination is all, schedule always, service will be all, it is natting. So we'll just enable. And we can double click on the policy just to verify that the details are correct, such as our in and out interfaces, what the NAT is doing, and if it is actually enabled. One annoyance is when you copy, it just copies the comment or it, it makes the comment copy of whatever. So I just maybe update the comment. And it is always best practice on any firewall or router even, any routes that you add or rules or whatever, if there is a place to name the stuff or to give a description of what it is, please use it because it will make it easier for other administrators that are working on the network to also know what, what, what this is. All right, now the wireless customer still will fail because if I go to CPE 10, if I run a ping to 8.8.8.8, .8 why is it failing? So before I explain to you or show you why, why it's failing, does anybody know why the wireless customers, why these links of theirs, their NAT addresses, isn't able to get any breakout? Is it something with a firewall policy? Is it uh, something with the interfaces that is incorrect? Or is it something with the routing? So I'm just gonna give it maybe like 30 seconds and then um, even if I don't get any answers, I'll explain it. It's just uh, to get you guys to also just think about the scenario, think about the issues, maybe what, what is the issue? Why can the wireless customers not break out but the fiber customer can? Awesome. All right, so what I think is actually going on is on our firewall, we've got the policy defined and the policy is correct. So the policy is actually working, it is correct, but we see no traffic is hitting the policy. We've got zero bytes. Now there's a few reasons that I could think of why this is. Um, let's see if I go into that 40 gate on the command line, we can quickly run some debugging and debugging allows you to see what's happening with the packets. So I might just do a diagnose, debug, flow, filter, and let's make the source address um, the IP address of CPE 10. So IP address print. So it will be this 10.201.0.2. That's going to be my source address. I'm going to do a diagnose, debug, flow, trace, start. 99 is just so that I see 99 lines of debug and I'm going to enable my debug. 
diagnose debug enable. Now I'm just going to go back to CPU 10 and let me see if I run a ping to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. Do I get anything on the firewall? I'm not getting anything on the firewall. So this is almost telling me that traffic isn't really getting to the firewall. But on the firewall, if I go onto my um, network and I look at my routes, you'll realize I added a route for the WAN interface or the, the link for the fiber customer, but I haven't added any routes yet for the wireless customer. So let's add it for them as well. So for the wireless customer, to make it quite simple, I'm going to say this whole 10.201.0.0 slash 24 is for my wireless customers, just to do this easily. Our gateway address, so this will now be the address of our wireless customers. Um, let me just see what that IP address is. If I go here and I go to wireless cust, if I hover over it, 10.254.255, it should be .1. 10.254.255.1. That looks correct. So let me apply that. Let's go back onto our CPE. Let's see, can I ping? No, I can't ping. So the traffic isn't even hitting the firewall yet. So let's do what we just did with our firewall when we tried to add it to Eve the first time. Let's figure out what is happening to the packets. So if I ping 8888 and I look at my topology uh, router seven, let's just jump on router seven through Winbox quickly. I think I still have it open here, I do. Perfect. So dot one is my wireless customer, so I'm routing cr traffic correctly. Let me just check from router seven, can I ping any of those link addresses via the VRF. So let's say, can I ping 10201.0.2? Can I ping that from my wireless? I can. So in theory, this should work. Let's just look at our IP routes. I just want to see, do I have an interface for that breakout on my wireless customers. I do, so wireless VR, VRF wireless customers should be the address that's uplinking to my firewall. So I can get to that IP from router seven, which is actually kind of like the next hop but I can't get to it from, let, let me see, if I ping from the firewall, execute ping 10.201.0.2. So it is actually pinging Does the wireless customers have a default route. Let's just check that. So if I go into my routes, find my wireless customers, they do have a default route and I am learning their routes via BGP. So this all looks good to me. Um, let me just quickly make sure on the CPE, the CPE 10, uh, IP route print. Let's just see, do I have routes there? Yes, I do. So let's do a ping 10 201 Okay, that's fine. IP firewall NAT print. I am masquerading the traffic out and it's not disabled. So this all still looks pretty good. Let's just get to router six. Now this I'll do from Winbox again on the uh, Ramon. So there's router. I just want to make sure it is actually router six. So router six goes to our customers, which we could call the ABR, even though we, we're not, it's not an ABR really. Um, that's just an edge. 
So from router six, can I actually ping 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 via, no, 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 no. Let's just close all the windows and do another terminal. And can I ping 8.8.8.8 .8 from the wireless customers? Wireless. I can't. If I go OP routes and I look at my wireless customers from here, I am learning a default route out, but I'm not getting any breakout. This is really interesting. But I, I think why I'm not getting any breakout here is because the source is also something that the firewall isn't aware of. one I'm just trying to think what the actual issue could be because there I can see the packet from wireless customer and then from router six traffic should be going to nine 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 seven which is normal. So if I go into router seven, this pushes my default route out to 10.254.255.2, which is correct because that should be the IP address for the 48. Let's just make sure. But we saw it was working from router seven. So there's an untrust that is correct. Okay, but I'm looking for 10, 254, 255.2, which is correct. I wonder. Let me go to router six again. Let's just do a ping to 8.8.4.4 .4 VRF or wireless customers and the source IP is 10 to 5 0 .1. one let's just leave that running and then on router 7 I just want to see am I actually receiving those uh, packets that traffic and I should be receiving them let's just check on our routes so for wireless customer, for 10.201.00/30, that's over Ether2. So let's check on Ether2. If I torch that interface, am I actually seeing this traffic? Let's check here. So I'm doing the ping. There I see some BGP stuff. But I'm not actually seeing that traffic because I know for a fact the firewall portion was an issue. We have set the interface correctly. The ranges seem correct. 10, 201, 0, 0, slash. Uh, well, it should still technically work. But let's just change this anyways. So I'm just going to make this 10 slash 24. No, that wasn't an issue. Okay, and let's just scratch the policy completely quickly. Add it fresh. Uh, let's just call this wireless cast internet. Incoming wireless, outgoing untrust source. 
is the source we just created destination all service all action accept flow base net we are masquerading our local sessions and we'll enable the policy and once this is enabled let's quickly see can we break out but i feel like it's still going to fail uh, bing 8.8.8.8 .8 still failing okay so let's just trace the traffic now properly so on router 6 there's two CPE 10 let's just torch this interface see if we can pick up those packets I can see the packets so it is trying to get to 8.8.8.8 um, I just want to see on router 7 do I still have a BGP network for 8.8.8.8 no I don't Okay, so that, that that should all be fine, actually. That is our peer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so from here, if I look at my routing table for the wireless customers, its default route should be going out over ether two. So let's look at interfaces, ether2, torch this. And then let's see, do I actually pick up those pings? I think I did see it for a second. Um, 10. 201, no, but that's BGP stuff. Hmm. Let's quickly check from the firewall. Can I actually ping? I, I, I know I can ping. I've been Uh, we just need to execute ping. I know I can ping that. I know I can ping 10.201.0.1, which is the WAN IP of router 6. And I can ping 0 0.2, which is. So there's definitely something wrong with how the default route is being sent. Let's just quickly have a look at our router 7 config. So we have VRFs, we have wireless customers, we're redistributing. That's where we redistributed. Oh, I think I know the issues, but we'll see. Um, let me jump onto router 6. Let's go into our routing, BGP, VRF, wireless customers. Okay, now we are redistributing our connected routes. So this is all normal. This all looks good. And it's so frustrating because it's working on the fiber customers, but it's not working for our um wireless customers now and the only component that's changed is the firewall <clears throat> let's check something on router seven again Early BGP. Okay, so the only thing difference that I can see is with the fiber customers, I'm redistributing my static routes. With the wireless customers, I'm not. So let's just do that because that default route is a static route that was added. Um, but it's strange to me that it was working on the Mikrotik firewall. 
Let's quickly go to CP10. No, you're still fading. So it's definitely not that. So the traffic goes to the firewall. And if I ping towards the internet, so let's ping 8844 VRF uh, wireless customers. I wonder, let me go into the IP firewall here. Let me check my NAT. Oh, shucks, I'm natting some stuff. What am I natting? Let's just see. Uh, I don't need to do this. So here I'm saying, okay, let me disable both of these naturals quickly. Let's see if that actually fixes the issue or not. Doesn't look like it. But that shouldn't be there either. Because with this natural, basically what's happening is I'm saying anything going out of the VRF customer uh, masquerade that. So we don't really want to do that. But anything on Ether 3, I'm also natting out. Let me just check what the, what is my Ether 3. That should actually be my link out to... No, my Ether 3 goes into my switch. What is this? <laughs> What were we doing? I, I want to actually watch some of our older videos and see what I was doing with that, that interface and what I was trying to accomplish or doing. I, I mean, it's it's obviously something that we were doing with the internet, but the traffic doesn't go that way anymore. Okay, so we've disabled our naturals. And if I ping from the wireless customer, it's still failing. My hope is correct because that is self-defined. Let me just quickly add, uh, but it should be pinging it out over that interface. Let's try this ping source address. 10254-2550, uh, not zero, dot one. Okay, let's do the same thing from the firewall quickly. Um, so we're gonna go execute ping dash options source 10 dot 254-255 dot two. Let's do an execute ping 8888. So even that is failing. Let's jump back on the firewall. Admin password. What did we make a mistake on? We've got policies. Um, let me just add the network address quickly for the firewall which should be this address. And let's apply that. Can I ping out yet? No, I cannot. And if I look at my routing, that should actually be a local route. So let's just look at the firewall from the command line. If I do a get router info, Routing table, detail, 10.254.255.2. That is a directly connected route. Oh, uh, why do I have a suspicion this is breaking further down the line? Let me just quickly jump onto my command prompt of my computer. Let's just do a route print. And then we'll look for anything that is 10.254.255.star. 10, Do I have any routes for that? No, I don't. Uh, 
hang on a second. Hang on a second. Okay, I've got an idea. So on router seven, what we don't have is, we don't have a way for the internet. No, but we're natting, the, we should be natting the traffic out. So that's, that doesn't matter. Oh, this is so frustrating. That's right, internet. Because I know on router 7, I just do a ping 8888. That works. But if I ping, let's say 88. Eight. But why does that work? But 8.8.4.4. Also works. No. Come on. No, man. What the? What the heck? <laughs> so did we troubleshoot ourselves into a way that we were troubleshooting so hard that we fixed it? Um, so my best guess is the NAT rule that we had on router seven that was NATing traffic out um to the firewall was actually breaking the communication like that that's my only answer to that because i think the traffic was coming in as the natted address and we weren't allowing traffic from that natted address and it probably just took some time um, for the stuff to understand where it's going that's the only thing that makes sense to me because the internet is working now. I can get to the internet from my wireless customers. Uh, but I know that somebody had a, I don't want to say issue, but a point they were making was that my wireless customers and your fiber customers, even though they're in different VRFs, they could still reach each other because of the firewall, which was a micro at that point. But now that we've swapped the firewall out with an actual firewall, if I ping, 169.255.101.2, which is the CP13 IP from this wireless um, customer. Will it work? Let's see. Ping 169.255.101.2. And let's just specify the source as well as 10.201.0.2. And that's failing. But I want to show you why it's failing. And again, I mentioned it earlier, it's because of the zones on the firewall. Let's leave this ping running. And let's quickly do another debug. It's on the firewall. Look at all these uh, logs we're getting now. Look, at, uh, it's already doing what, what I wanted to show you guys. So I'm trying to run a ping from, let me just stop the ping so it doesn't keep going. So I'm trying now to run a ping from the wireless customer to the fiber customers. And if I copy this ping um, just into a notepad maybe, you'll see actually what the debug is telling us, what is happening to the traffic. So right now we have traffic from um, on our root VDOM and the source it's coming from is 10.201.0.2 and we see it's trying to get to 169.255.101.2 on 2048, which is for the ICMP. And we can see it's coming from the wireless customers. But what it's saying is uh, the gateway. So it has a, a route to get there. It knows what the gateway is, but there's no firewall policy defined. So it's just dropping that traffic. So those customers will never get to each other's ranges. They won't be exposed to each other. So you are pretty safe when you, are, when you have a firewall, um, let's say in the middle, managing that stuff for you. Okay, so finally we have the firewall bit sorted out. Now I want to actually convert some of my <clears throat> services. So previously we had router six and seven connecting to each other on BGP to deliver our VRF. We are going to change that now. 
So this router too looks like a pretty good router. It's in the middle of the network. It's got a bunch of redundant links and or redundant paths it can take. We might even add some more paths later on like this, but I'm not gonna do that just yet. But what I want us to do is remove the BGP peers from router six and seven so that they don't peer to each other. They will now peer to router two and we're going to convert router two in what, into what we call a route reflector. So the route reflector's job is basically to deliver BGP services across the network without having to mesh our entire network. Crazy and very cool, but we're, we're going to use that now. So I'm going to convert this router two into the route reflector. So hello router six, I'm just quickly going to winbox into you. And then your BGP, your peers, I'm just going to update the peers. So the remote address will now become 9992. And I'm not going to set anything there, but I will go into advanced and I will put on the L2 VPN because we will also be spanning some layer two services. So let's apply that. And I'm going to do the same on router seven, which is here. So let's go into our routing BGP. Let's go into our peers. We're changing this to dot two and we're enabling IP and L2 VPN. And then we need to do the same on router two. So I'm just going to connect on Ramon, get to router two. Let's go into our routing BGP. Let's add a new instance. And the instance will be AS65000, so 65000. The name we can make the same, or we can call that whatever we want. Router ID 999.2. And that looks good. We need to make sure that client to client reflection is enabled, but it is by default. We'll hit okay. We'll go into our routing BGP. Let's add our peers. So our first peer will be peer to R6. Our instance will be the AS65000. Our remote address will be 9.9.9.6. .9 remote AS65000. And very important, we are now going to tick route reflect. So this will turn router two into a route reflector for router six. And it's gonna be the same for router seven. So I don't need to tweak anything else here. Maybe let's just set the TTL to default. And in advanced, select L2 VPN and VPN four. Update source, we'll make that the LO0, and I'll apply that. So let's see, my peer should come up, and it did establish. Perfect. Let's do the same. Call it peer to R7. Our instance will be the AS65000. Our remote address will be 999.7. Our remote AS65000. We enable the route reflect. Set that to default. And enable the L2 VPN VPN4 and set the update source to LO0. That looks perfect. We can apply this. And both of our peers are established. That looks really good. Let's quickly go into our VPN4 routes. And we see we're still learning the VPN4 routes. Our interfaces are now becoming unknown. That's not good. Uh, let's see, is the internet stuff still working? Let's go to CP10 maybe. Uh, let's not try and ping that. Let's just try and ping Google. We can ping out, so that's fine. That's good. Um, let's check from router six. If I look at my IP routes, and I look at my routing BGP. If I look at the VPN4 routes, I can see my VPN4 routes. Okay, that's fine. 
and there's our interfaces. So it's still going through Ether2 for the default routes. And there's the interfaces, our labels, and our route distinguishers. Groovy. So all of that's working fine. We're just doing it through a route reflector now instead of peering directly um, with our BGP peer. And this, like I said, it, it means that you don't need to mesh everything. All of the BGP services can now come from router two. And we're going to test this by doing some um, layer two. We're going to do some VPLS. So let's set up another set of thingies and a few more nodes. Actually, do I really want to set up two more nodes? Yes, I do. And what's funny is I'm not even going to make the nodes Mikrotik. Let's just make them some pretty basic Cisco routers. Add two of them. <clears throat> and this is where they will come in. Ooh, let's actually do this. I want to peer router four and router five to router two as a root route reflector as well, because let's bring in the VPLS um, in router four and five. So <laughs> we're just going to jump onto router four and five. And we're quickly going to configure the BGP. So routing BGP peer, routing BGP, let's just export. <clears throat> No BGP configure, so routing BGP instance add AS is 65000, name will make it AS 65000, and router ID or the RID is 9.9.9.4. .9 then we can do a routing BGP peer add name peer to uh, R2 RR. <clears throat> that's our name we need a remote as which is still 65000 we need a remote address which is 999.2 which is the loopback address configured on router 2 uh, so those are the base objects we need to add <clears throat> so then what else we want to add is an instance as65000 we're going to add our address families. So this will be IP, um, L2 VPN, and VPN4. There we go. And let's set our update source to LO0. Cool. Router 4 is done. Let's just do the same on router five quickly. And for me, this is just quicker to do it on the, oh, that sounds fine. That sounds fun. Sounds really fun. Good old Akamai. Okay, so IP address, print. Oh, I don't even know why I'm looking at the IPs. Let's just look at our routing BGP here, or instances. Let's export. Nothing there. Routing BGP instance add name AS65000 AS65000 RID or router ID 999.5 added. Now let's do a routing BGP peer add name peer to R2 RR. <clears throat> remote address 999.2 remote AS 65000 uh, instance is our AS 65000 our address families is IP L2 VPN and VPN 4 version 4 VPN v4, okay. Anything else I want to add? Uh, looks good to me. Let's add it. And let's quickly add peers to 
router 4 and router 5 from the route reflector so that we can do some magical VPLS quickly. Which I hope is quickly, <laughs> because we've done so much troubleshooting tonight. Um, but it's good, it's fine, it's fun. I love troubleshooting. <laughs> it reminds me of that meme with that um, Asian guy going, I love refrigerators. <laughs> I don't know why that popped in my head. Let's see, router two. Hello, router two. We're going to add some peers. So peer two R four instance that nine 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 four six five triple zero. Enable the route reflect. Nothing else we want here. We can set it to default, but two five five and default is the same thing. Um, advanced IP L two VPN VPN four. Update source LO0, apply that. And I'm just going to copy this just to make it a bit quicker. So let's call this peer to R5. And then there's not much I need to change. Looks good. And as you see, all my peers are up. So now I've got a route reflector in my network. And this route reflector is connected to my network so I don't waste and make everything fully meshed. So this is pretty good. Okay, now we can actually work on adding some VPLS. Um, there's two ways we can add it. The typical, I'd say people typically just make use of like static um, VPLS, which is done through the MPLS protocol, the LDP. But we'll do the BGP signal VPLS because I've set up VPLS or BGP for that now specifically. So it makes sense. So let's just move those around a little bit. Add our routers to router five and router four. So E00, we'll go to ETH4, perfect. So let's add our routers. E00, ETH4, it's fine. All right, here's some good stuff. And again, the BGP signal, the VPLS, we're not doing on our CPs. There's, there's nothing you're doing on the actual CP now. This all happens on your provider network. So let's just quickly do this on Winbox. So let me jump on to, well, let me close all of these other windows. Let's connect onto Roman, find router four. Let's just start from there, connect. So we've got our BGP signaling being done. First thing we wanna do is add a bridge for the VPLS because you're going to reference the bridge when you actually create the VPLS interface. Um, well, the, the interface is dynamically created, but you'll see in a sec what I mean. So we'll call this bridge VPLS. Um, this can be cus 3 or something. Um, I do want to disable STP. I don't want to use it. And I'm going to apply that. So there's the virtual Mac. It's assigned. That's fine. And then what I'm going to do is the ports. I'm just going to bridge the port that's actually going to the customer on ETH4. And that's the same on both routers. So this is actually straightforward. So ETH4, I'm adding to my VPLS bridge. I'm applying that. Hit OK. And let's just maximize that so it looks a bit bigger. So we've got a VPLS bridge. We've assigned the port to it. Now what we can do is we can go into our uh, MPLS and then VPLS and then we can add the BGP VPLS and from here I can just hit the plus call this oh sorry I hit the microphone there it might sound a bit weird cost 3 VPLS and our route distinguisher will be 1 colon 3 hang on a second um, is the live stream still running 
because I think I closed the window. I just want to make sure the live stream is actually still running. Because that would be unfortunate if the live stream's done. All right, it's still live. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So we can make it one colon three, one colon three, one colon three. So the site ID, I'm going to make this four because it's router four. And the bridge is now, we're selecting that VPL bridge that we, VPLS bridge that we created. So this will be VPLS underscore cast three. Um, somebody once asked me what is control word? So control word is basically just a, let's say a frame or a header that's added to the frames so that the routers don't confuse um, the packets for packets so that they think it's a MAC address that it's learning and not an IP address. So in, in short, that's what the control word does. Uh, you can read more about it on articles, obviously, but Mikritik also explains it quite well on their wiki. So feel free to look at the control word there, but that's just in essence what it does. Just leave it on. It's, it's good to have it. All right. So I've added now this uh, VPLS interface for the customer. Now we need to do the signaling on router five. So let's just open up another Winbox. Connect to ROM on, get to router five, connect. Let's go into our bridge, add a bridge, uh, VPLS underscore cast three, disable the STP, apply it, add our port. So ether four goes to VPLS bridge, apply that. And then we can go into our MPLS, VPLS, BGP, VPLS, hit the plus. Uh, I, I, don't know, I think I called it VPLS underscore cost three. Route distinguisher, one column three, one column three, one column three. One column three. And our site ID for router five will be five. The bridge will be VPLS underscore cus three. And I can just apply this. Now in theory, it should come up and it has come up. So we've got a dynamically running slave BGP <laughs> VPLS interface. Wow, that's a mouthful. There's a lot of stuff happening there. But in theory, if I go to my interfaces, you'll see there's a VPLS interface now. And what's kind of happening is if we go to our bridge and you go to your ports, that dynamically VPLS interface, um, so when we speak about VPLS, it is pretty advanced. Like that is, um, let's say, I don't want to say top tier, but it, it, it's what service providers deal with at a high like level it's it's it is it is advanced like um i'm not gonna say it's it's not advanced because if you get into micritic and you um you, you get different certification paths so you get like a mtc and a which is the equivalent of a cc and a almost uh, let, let's look at that so micritic certification path so just to give you a better understanding, if we go into the Mikrotik training, I wonder if they show the certifications here. They do. So you get your MTCNA, which is your base certification. It's pretty standard. It, it teaches you how to assign IPs, do DHCP, how wireless works, how the firewall works. Um, very basic intro stuff, but it's a good starting position for any network engineer. Then from the MTCNA, you can go up to an MTCRE, which is the routing engineer. So this is where you learn more about like uh, ECMP, equal cost multipath routing. You learn about OSPF. Uh, you do a lot of other stuff with static routes and mangles and such. So this is what the RE is. And then finally you get the MTCINE, which is short for internet working engineer. So um, think of this as the top level certification. It's, it's the equivalent of somebody getting their uh, CCIE on Cisco or uh, JNCIE with Juniper. Um, so this is where you'll be learning a lot about BGP 
and using advanced services like MPLS and VPLS. So if it is, if you feel like it is a bit advanced, um, don't stress. It is, it is very advanced. If you don't get it, um, I, I'll try and explain it in simpler terms because me just labbing it might confuse somebody that's, that's new to um, this type of networking. But it is really fun and it's really interesting to build these type of networks. And uh, for the record, <laughs> I am uh, MTC INE certified as well. So it is pretty awesome and it was quite a journey to get there. Um, I was working with Mikrotik for maybe a year or so and then I got to the MTC INE. But I, I don't want to say like Mikrotik is easy or something. It's just because I have been working in ISPs and various vendors equipment. So it was um, a lot easier for me to grasp because I have dealt with stuff like MPLS, VPLS and BGP before. But don't don't worry about it. it it's really um, interesting stuff when you see what it's doing. But in essence, what VPLS is doing, uh, it allows us to span layer two between two different locations. Now, what does that mean? Um, you can imagine that this cable running from this router 24 is actually now connected like a switch. Think of it as a virtual switch almost that goes across the whole network for these two routers. So it's almost like they're directly plugged into each other. It's called a pseudo wire and it's such cool te uh, technology when you actually get into it. But I'll show you what the outcome is now. So we've actually created um, a pseudo wire now on between router four and five so that router 24 and router 25 can communicate directly to each other, which is really fun. So let's go into router 24 and you'll see in a second what I'm talking about. So I'm just not going to do any config. I'm just going to add an IP address on the router, really. Uh, let's just do the same on the second router. So we don't need to wait for it to boot and prompt and all that stuff. No. <clears throat> Alright, so on router 24, what we're going to do is enable. Then we're just going to go config T or let's, let's just do a show IP in brief. <clears throat> so ETH0 slash 0 is down. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to clear my throat. That's a bit rude. So it's admin down. So let's do a config T int E00. No shut. And then we'll just assign an IP address. So IP address. And we can make this whatever we want. Let's make it 172.18.0.1. And then the mask will make a slash 24. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. And let's add an IP address, but let's make dot two the IP for router 25. So we'll hit enable. We'll go config T int E00, no shut. IP address. Uh, I've already forgotten when I made the IP. I think like 172.16.1. Uh, let's just see. 172.18.0.2 on the slash 24 network. Uh, it shouldn't be right. It should be a space there. So it's just going to be mad at me because I <laughs> made it one word. So it's trying to do uh, DNS or domain lookup on that. <clears throat> okay, let's just oh I want to just double R W W R that's so badly. Okay, but let's see. Can I ping 172.18.0.1? I can. Can I ping dot two? And I can. I can! <laughs> How freaking cool is that? So I've essentially now ran a very long LAN cable, maybe even hundreds of miles across my provider network so that the customer has layer two between um, his two sites. So VLANs can be spanned over the, these interfaces as normal. Um, you can add IPs, you can do bridging. So I, I would actually kind of prefer having Mikrotix here instead of the Cisco's because then we can just bridge this uh, uplink interface. 
to our actual LAN and then everything will be able to get to each other. But it's, it's really just there um, to deliver that layer two service to very specific customers. It's, it's a very niche requirement, but the niches where you require it is for big customers. Usually it might be, um, I don't want to go too far into it, but these are important customers. They might be working in the private sector and they might be doing some very big projects and they, they need VPLS to, um, deal with these projects and we don't even need to say it's, it's for customers it could be you you're the isp maybe you have another data center um, so it's isp1 but it's data center two and you want these routers to all connect to each other um, and still have layer two connectivity directly with one another then you could use vpls for that purpose as well which is really cool <clears throat> Okay, so we've got VPLS. Sorry, let, let me just take a sip of water before I clear my throat the whole time. Awesome. Okay. What else can we do? Because I, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to break the network. Uh, um, maybe let's play around with some some SD WAN stuff on the forty gates again. Because I know some people saw me just have it up and running and it was working but let's maybe do a actual setup on it or no i know what we can do uh let's turn these nodes off because it's very good for me to maybe just shut them down so they don't hog my bandwidth and don't worry we'll come back to this network uh in the next stream <coughs> we'll probably start adding some more isps to the ixp and then we can start doing more things with BGP, especially with the um, route filters and stuff like uh, communities. Cool. So let's just close this lab. <clears throat> and then I tease this a little bit. So I'm calling this failover lab. And this was more or less specifically for you, Bogdan. Um, because you were inquiring to me, you want to have a link. Tell me if this, this fits the scenario, because this is what I took out of what you, you said last time. Like you've got one static link with an ISP, and then you've got another link that comes in over triple POE. And you basically wanted to do PCC. Um, is, is that the case that I understand you correctly, or am I wrong? That's if you're still in the chat. <laughs> Let me see. All right. Well, let's just go over this uh, at any rate. Um, so we've got a router. Um, the two LAN ranges that I specified here, this probably doesn't apply to you. This is more or less that I wanted to show people um, the different types of stuff that you can do on a Mikrotik router. And it is it is applicable to us here. So let's jump onto Winbox and we're gonna go to our router quickly because I wanna talk a little bit about failover and load balancing on Mikrotik. So there's so many different options on how you can achieve stuff, um, but we're going to look at some of the basic stuff first. So let's log on to our neighbors, ISP1. From there, I should be able to connect onto Roman and then get to our router, customer router. So I've got Winbox open. So let's just quickly see what's happening here. So right now I've got two different routes and just to reiterate this is already now set up for failover so in the event of um, routing stopping for zero 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 slash zero if this route goes blue to isp1 then it will fail over to isp2 but here's something that i i think a lot of people run into uh, with issues when they're trying to set up failover and it it, it generally happens you'll get what we call a CPE, 
and I've gone over it a few times in other labs or videos. And the CPE is short for customer presence equipment and your network provider, your ISP will typically put down their own CPE at your site. And it might be an ONT for like fiber or something, but they put down their device at your premises and the actual fiber cable or the AP comes into their equipment and then they might hand the service off to you, uh, to your router. Now, the, the issue with this is we have a default route now set up. Let's go back onto the router. We have a default route set up that says any traffic, uh, all internet traffic go to 169.255.0.1. And that is this uh, ISP1's equipment now. But what happens if ISP1's actual link to the internet goes down? Will traffic fail over? So let's just quickly emulate that because we can suspend this link on ETH1. And if I go to our router, I'll just do this from the command line quickly. If I do a ping from here, will I have internet access? No. And if I go and look at my routing table in Winbox, do I have any internet? Well, it shows I have internet. The router hasn't gone black, but or, or blue. It's still black, it's still active. <laughs> and now my connection's dropped as well. Uh, main reason it's dropped is because my um, link via the Romon is off now. But as you saw, if I go on to um, the command line, I can't ping out to Google. If I do a IP route print here, my route is still active to ISP1. And if I do a trace route, or let's do a tool trace. 8888. We can see it actually gets to ISP1's equipment, but it's not going past. Now, the reason why it's actually not failing over is because the route stays active. And we could force that um, by two means, two different ways. Let me just read there. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. All right, I just wanna connect onto the Roman again on ISP1, connect onto our customer router. So the reason it's not going down is because the actual link between my ISP and their equipment that's physically on site and my router didn't go down. So ether one is still technically up it's still working so that's why the traffic is now trying to route um over that isp1 interface so there are ways to work around this uh, but i'm uh, i don't think i'm gonna be discussing recursive routing in this video but you could set up something we call a recursive route and the recursive route would essentially do like a lookup to see if the gateway is actually working and then if it sees that the stuff isn't working correctly it will just turn all those routes blue that's associated with it. But this is very basic failover. We could also maybe do something with the route preferences because I've got a dynamic static route. That sounds so weird, dynamic static route. But it's basically just on my uh, DHCP server or DHCP client, sorry. My interface for ISP1, it's set to add a default route after it attains an IP address. But what we could do is we could set the distances, we could change them. So if there is maybe an outage, there is an issue with ISP1 and we want to fail over to ISP2, what we could also do is just update this route and change the distance. So to do that, you just come to the distance, change that to a higher pro uh, value because the lowest value always wins in, in the routing world typically. So let's just make this distance 20. And then you'll see that route has gone blue and the one below it has gone black. So if I now do a ping or a trace route to 8.8.8, .8 I can see it's actually going over my triple POE. And if I ping 8.8.8.8, .8 it is actually working. All right, that is awesome. Let me just see, do we have um, 
PCC configured here? No, we don't. So let's do this from scratch, actually. Let's do some load balancing. What load balancing types do you get on Macritic? Does anybody know? Let's be smart about it. Let's let's just Google it. Micritic load balancing types. Um, maybe helps if I spell that correctly. So we have failover. We have firewall marking. We have ECMP. We have PCC. NTH. I have no clue what that is. I've never worked with that. Uh, bonding. Bonding I can show as well. OSPF and BGP. So those protocols I discuss in detail usually and failover we just did that with like some static stuff so let's load balance with some firewall marking now what is firewall marking well that goes into the mangle rules so let's go into our customer router and mangle rules essentially allows you a way to mark traffic or do certain things with your packets that filter through the firewall of the router so a very basic use case for this would be and this is why i've got these two networks a LAN pc and a cctv network is maybe we want to split traffic um, so that all of the lan network goes out over isp1 because it's a nice um i, I don't want to say it's nice i actually want to say it's an average network because we actually want our cctv to have the better performance um so let's say the CCTV would actually go over ISP1 because it's some fiber connection and we want to guarantee it's always up and it's nice. And then the LAN PC or the, the, the LAN ranges will go out over ISP2, which is over a triple PoE connection. Now, if we want to load balance that way, we can just go into our IP change security issue which IP change security issue? Um, I'll wait for your response, but I'm not completely certain what IP uh, change security issue. So while this happens, I'm just going to go into my routers and then IP firewall and let's set up mangle rules. So what mangle rules can do is we can say it is a pre-routing chain. So before traffic is routed anywhere, what we can do is we could say traffic coming from, so we can specify a source address here. So we could potentially make this anything from 192.168.1.0 slash 24. We could also specify an in interface. So in this case, it's ether three, which is for the LAN. And then we can set an action and our action will then just be to mark routing and the routing mark <coughs> let's just make this to isp2 we said is where we wanted to send it so let's apply that and i'm going to add another mangle rule it's going to be pre-routing again, but the source address, we're now going to make it 172.16.1.0 slash 24. And the in interface will now be ether4 for the CCTV. Our action will also be mark routing, and we can make this to ISP1. I can apply that. So now I've got two mangle rules that will essentially mark any packets from those ranges with the routing table or the routing information that I gave it. Will it work? Not yet. So what we need to just do in this case is we want to go into our IP routes and we just want to add some routes here. So we want to add a default route and then we can make the gateway the same. So we can make the gateway for ISP1. It's 169 169.255.0.1. We can leave the check gateway, but uh, that's not that important when we are dealing with static interfaces like this, but very important. We've got a routing mark. So if I click this, there will be drop downs for to ISP one and to ISP two. So I'll just say this is to ISP one. And I will apply this 
and then I'll add another route. So default route and the gateway will be the triple POE. We can check gateway with a ping and this routing mark will be to ISP2. Let's apply that. Now we've got routing marks. So we've got default routes to get to the internet um, with those IPs. If I go into my IP firewall and you look at your mangle, uh, let's just see if I can maximize this. Yes, I can. No packets are marked yet, but that's because I haven't sent any traffic out yet. So let's go into the LAN PC, which again is just a Eve Docker. Oh, I get what you mean. So in that case, um, there's actually documentation on Eve, but this is kind of why I don't, I don't want to say why, why PCC isn't preferred, but, or it's not specifically PCC. It, it's more or less, uh, ECMP as well, because ECMP has the same type of issue and it is related to your DNS. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty weird. So in that case, what I would probably do is if, if you want to get to like, let's say a bank, then I would probably just create a rule to route their traffic over a specific uh, interface so that the IP address won't change for the bank because the bank, they don't like it when you're connecting and your IP address is suddenly changing uh, from something because they think it's a man in the middle attack. They think uh, somebody's trying to hijack the session. So <laughs> that's why stuff like that happens. Um, so in that case, again, I would just route statically for, for stuff like banks um, directly over an interface and that you could just do with the mangle rule now like this as well you just get the bank's IP range and you just mangle it and force it out over one of your links instead of load balancing it uh, let's just quickly check is this working so I'm on the PC so can I ping 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 yes I can if I do a to erase root to 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8 .8. um, I'm being silly. This isn't CMD. I can see it goes to my router. And then from there, it actually goes over the triple POE. So that is going over customer two. Brilliant. And that's exactly what we wanted. And let's do ISP. Let's just see if the CCTV goes over ISP1. So terminal, let's do a trace route to 8.8.8.8. And yes, that is going to ISP1. So now we are load balancing traffic using <laughs> uh, mangle rules. So that is what the firewall marking is. ECMP is a very uh, devilish thing and th th this again is also going to cause the the issues uh, with the banks and such so what, what we want to do is just go into our router let's set up ECMP quickly so I'm just going to disable these uh, mangles but there you see the mangles got traffic and that's how many packets we're going over them so to configure an ECMP route all that we need to do and this is now MTC RE type of stuff but this isn't really that that crazy. It's an easy concept once you understand what you're doing. So let's just disable all the static routes. I might drop, uh, wait, that is being assigned through the DHCP. So let's just quickly copy this maybe, copy that, apply it. And then I might just disable it as well. And then on our IP DHCP client, let's just remove the add static route. And now you see we will, we're going to lose that uh, DAS when it reconnects. I think, I hope it should. All right. So let's just add a route for ECMP. So what ECMP does is if we go into our gateway, ECMP, what does it stand for? Equal cost multipath. So 
essentially the cost to get to the next hop to the gateway is exactly the same but there's different paths to break out so it's also i think per connection um, but it's not really pcc um, where it will just your traffic will just go out over whichever interface it feels like and there, there's no real control over it but let's add an ecmp route so our default or our destination is 0000 slash 0 our gateway will be 169.255.0.1 and then all we need to do is hit this drop down and now we can specify a second gateway that's ecmp um, so for that i'll specify the triple poe i can check the gateway with ping and i'll just apply that that's that's it we we've done ecmp now um, so if i go onto my lamb pc can i ping 8888 yes i can and let's see if i run a trace route to 888 that goes out over isp1 that's still isp1 let's see if we do from the cctv so all the traffic is now just kind of going out over isp1 but this is just for pings let's maybe make it interesting by also going to firefox and just uh, going to some stuff and while that's happening i actually think the best way for us to see if it is being utilized um i want you to specifically keep an eye out on these two interfaces at the top for isp or you could look at all three of them but the triple poe and the ether one will be the important bits so let's go to youtube on both machines maybe uh youtube i don't even know if that went to youtube so there you see traffic is kind of like coming in over both interfaces so this is a very dirty and cheap way of doing load balancing but it has its drawbacks specifically if i do a, a google search on Microtik ecmp um, there's the wiki and the errors that you're talking about there's the known issues dns issues isp specific dns service might have custom configurations that treat specific requests from isp network differently than requests from other networks so in case connection is made via other gateway those sites will not be accessible to avoid that we suggest to use a third party public dns servers okay so that's not too much of an issue but it will still cause problems if you're going to your bank and your source IP or, or the IP address that the bank see, sees changes just suddenly. Um, <laughs> that's why ECMP is also a bit of a, it, it's a round robin. It's, hey, let's just decide what, what's happening. Route, routing table flushing. Every time when something triggers flush of the routing table and ECMP cache is flushed, connections will be assigned to gateways once again and may not be the same gateway. So this can cause issues as well. Look, ECMP works, but for me, it's like the quick and dirty way of doing PCC. Awesome. So let's just scratch the ECMP world. I'm not going to touch, I don't know what NTH is. Let's go into this article, NTH, what is that? nth load balancing i have no clue what is nth <laughs> nth um microtech does anybody know what nth is have you ever encountered this have you worked with this before um because i've never seen nth maybe i'm being silly and it, it might be just a different uh, like uh, acronym or abbreviation or whatever but i don't know what nth is so i'm not even <laughs> i'm not even going to uh 
let, let's see, do they maybe have any type of configuration examples? Uh, NTH load balancing with masquerade. Lots of mangle rules we're adding. Connection state new, NTH. This NTH kind of looks very similar to per connection classification. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll give this a spin myself later. I just haven't done NTH. I don't know what it is. Uh, bonding, bonding is pretty cool, but bonding is more or less uh, for stuff you want to do on your own network. So you typically, you're not going to bond to your ISP network unless you've got multiple links from your ISP and they are like, okay, cool, we can bond with you then you could do bonding to the ISP. But typically where you'll see bonding occur is on a Mikrotik router. Uh, I wonder if we can do it. Mm, it might take a little bit too long because we'll have to put in a Cisco switch. But in essence, bonding, if I go into the Mikrotik router, go to our interfaces, um, let's say LAN and CCTV, both of these, we want it to be treated as a single uplink to a switch. And then from the switch, we'd manage these uh, endpoints with VLANs or whatever. So bonding is, we could just go to our bonding tab. If we hit the plus here, uh, what you get is you get bonding and your slaves are essentially the interfaces that you'll be bonding together. So you could, in essence, be bonding to physical interfaces into one virtual interface, one logical interface, so that um, the network sees this as one actual interface. But I, I don't want you to think um, it means, <laughs> it means if I bond two one gig interfaces, I have two gig speed. You'll be able to do two gigs over the bond, but each interface still only does one gig. Um, you'll get different modes, but typically the mode that you'll see the most is 802.3A2 um, So that that's something you'll you'll typically See the most because that is called LACP so link aggregation control protocol so You'll find this on most switch vendors. You'll find it on other Mikrotik switches. You'll find it on HPs. You'll find it on Huawei. You'll find it on Cisco. LACP is probably one of the most widely used link aggregation protocols that you can get. Um, and it's fairly straightforward to use. Transmit policy, typically on the Mikrotik, you'll just use layer two and three. And if I hit apply, I would have bonded those two interfaces together. So now we've got a bonding interface for LAN and CCTV. So we've made them one logical interface and now they can, and what we could typically do as well is, and if it was connecting to a switch, if we wanted to assign VLANs to that bonded interface, we could just do it through here. We'd go to our VLAN and then our interface, instead of being just like Ether3 or CCTV, you'd assign it to your bond. But make sure if you are bonding things that it needs to match on both ends, right? So if you've bonded um, two uplink ports on to a switch, then the switch also needs to have LACP configured and it also needs to have the VLANs tagged on it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It is going to give you issues. Okay, so that is one more thing that we, we can check off. We've done bonding. OSPF and BGP, I've, like I said, I've talked about this stuff so much um, and I usually run this on provider networks. BGP, I'll do a lot of things with. I mean, BGP, I use as a protocol for failover towards my CPEs and I also use BGP for peering to the internet. And as you saw, we use BGP to even provide services over MPLS such as uh, VRFs and VPLS. But I, 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 we're not gonna do any BGP or OSPF on the customer router. We're, we're just a normal user and we want failover. 
So that leaves us with PCC. So let's go into this load balancing doc. Let's see, can we find an example for PCC, manual PCC? So it has the same type of scenario. There's a, a router shooting things over access points. The only difference with our setup and that router setup is we are using triple PoE, whereas they've got two static addresses configured. So when I configured it, it was working but I felt something wasn't right with the firewall mangles, but you'll see when we actually add the, the PCC now. Now, we're just going to add this as it is kind of in the manual. We're, we're going to follow along with the manual to get things working for PCC specifically. So let's just jump onto our router and I just want to disable any ECMP I might have. So let's just, uh, disable you. Let's turn on the initial routes again. And let's start doing this. So first things first, uh, we do have the IP addresses assigned already. So we need to do the actual policy routing. So a lot of this is happening in the firewall. Uh, I think I've got NAT rules configured already. So let's just make sure about that as well. Firewall NAT. Okay, we are NATing traffic out. So it's just in the IP firewall, we need to specify a bunch of stuff. So here it says, okay, we first want to go into our mangle rules and we want to say any traffic before it gets routed with the destination of 10 triple one zero zero slash 24 action, we accept it. And it's coming in on the LAN interface. All right, that's pretty straightforward to do. So since my interface is very little because I've got a LAN and CCTV, I'm going to make some slight tweaks and adjustments. So I'm going to go into my IP firewall and then in my mangles, I'm going to still add the mangle. It's still going to be pre-routing, but my in interface, I want to add both of those interfaces and I don't want to add multiple rules for this. So how can I go about um, selecting multiple interfaces? as well? We've got the in interface list. So let's see, do we have a in interface list? Uh, we've got something there called triple POE, but that's not applicable. So before I continue, let's go into our interfaces, go into the interface list. Let's add a list and let's call this uh, LAN networks. That's the list I'm adding. And then we can hit the plus and then we can assign Ether3 and Ether4 to LAN networks. Awesome. So if I go back into my interface list, I have a LAN networks that I can select now. Awesome. So that covers one portion. Now we want to set our destination interface. So the first thing is the 169.255.00 slash 30. And we want to just set the action as accept. And that's it. So let's apply that. But now we've, we've got a very sticky and tricky situation. So the other issue that I have is if I add a mangle for the second connection, so the chain is pre-routing and the destination address. What the heck is the destination address going to be? Because on my ETH topology, my ISP2, it's running triple PoE. And what do we know about triple PoE? So triple PoE uh, essentially creates dynamic addresses. It gives us an IP address and that IP address might change uh, depending on the pool and the IPs available by the ISP. So right now it's assigning 169.254.0.2 to me, but that could change to something else. That could change to um, dot four, dot eight, dot 100. It could even be a different subnet. It could become something like 169.200. And I wouldn't know what to add in the destination address. So for me, I need something that's a bit like sticky um, so that I can get that dynamic address so that I can fill it into the address fields. So for me, the easiest thing to do is if I go into my triple P and I double click, um, 
this interface and I do a dial out, actually, I'm not doing it here. I need to go to my profiles. And then from the profiles, in my default profile, I can actually select an address list. So this address list, I'm going to make ISP WAN2. But you could give this any name, but I'll just make it ISP WAN2. So what's going to happen now is if I go into my IP firewall and I go into my address list, what you'll see is um, there's an address list called ISP WAN2. That's the name. And now it's picking up the address of the remote end dynamically. So I'm going to actually just use that as my destination address now, but you, you, you can't specify that here. You just need to go into your advance and then there's a destination address list, which I'll make my ISP um, to WAN. So that's going to be my destination. My in interface is going to not be an in interface, but an in interface list for my LAN networks. <coughs> and my action will be accept. Awesome. So now we've done part one. So part two, we're actually going to mark the traffic for um, packets coming in to the ISP links. So traffic coming in on ISP one, we're going to mark the connection as ISP one traffic coming in on ISP two, we're going to mark the connection as ISP two. So let's do that. Go into inbox, add those mangles. <clears throat> this is still a pre-routing chain. Our in interface. First one is ISP one. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to mark the connection to ISP con one. Apply that. Add another one. <coughs> and now our in interface for the second ISP will be the triple POE interface. And that we are also going to just mark the connection ISP con two. Okay. So that looks pretty relevant. Okay, next bit. Now we're actually going to do the PCC bit. So PCC, um, you'll see there's a per connection classifier. So think of this as streams that you are um, separating the data in. Uh, should I open up a paint? <clears throat> Man, this is going to look so bad, but it's fine. So there's a router. And then what PCC allows us to do is you get all these different like streams. Um, let's keep it that red. Make that red, make that blue, maybe. So these are all connections. Th these are all connections that a host is initiating <coughs> towards the internet. But what you could essentially do is you could merge, uh, I think is a good word, these streams so that it becomes like one nice big stream. So <coughs> so that could be ISP1 stuff. Man, that looks so bad. And then the other one, uh, I should have probably not made it a bunch of different colors, but that's fine. And then that might be a link for ISP2. So PCC allows you to basically create streams and then traffic will flow over the stream um, at that time per connection. So let's configure the per connection uh, firewall rules. So jump back on the Microtech. Let's hit that plus. And then we want to make sure it's pre-routing. Our in interface, we can set the in interface again as the list. Um, what we want is no connection marker. That's fine. It's not there by default. Uh, we want to go into our 
advanced and then there's a per connection classifier so this is quite important because this is uh, determining from the header what uh, like what from the stream do you want to grab so you could grab both addresses or both addresses and ports i typically see people just use both addresses which is fine because something from a specific destination going to or something from a specific source going to a specific destination is going to be put in this stream and something from the other source or destination will be put in the other stream but let's let's just make it both addresses for now and with per connection classifier this algorithm will be dependent on how many links you're actually wanting to load balance with pcc so if you have four links you'll put down four if you have two links you only put down two uh, if you have one link you, you're not going to do pcc because it's not going to do anything for you but we only have two links in the scenario but if there was three we we make three slash zero for the first stream three slash one for the second stream and three slash two for the third stream but i'm just going to make it two slash zero and then we need to look at our I think it says the destination address type. Okay, so the destination address type, we invert this and this will be unicast, I think. Oh no, it's local. So we're basically saying any destination address that isn't local, perfect. So any local address that that <laughs> any destination address that isn't local we'll, we'll be applying the pcc to and our action will be mark the connection so our action will be mark connection and then we can mark that with isp1 and to save some time i'm just going to take the same policy i'm going to copy this but we're going to change the stream so two slash one and we're going to mark the connection with isp2 going to apply that so now we've got our two pcc rules set up so that's perfect now we want to set up routing marks for to place the connections in the good or the correct routing tables okay so let's just add another pre-routing and let's just say anything that is the connection mark of ISP con one with the in interface of our in interface list. And then we're going to mark the routing. So mark routing to ISP one. Let's apply that. And same thing, we're going to copy this again LAN networks, but we're going to say anything with the connection mark of ISP connection two. We're going to mark that routing as ISP two. Let's apply that. And we're almost done. Now we just need to, the firewall rules are done. Now we just need to add the routes. So let's quickly add them. Jump back on here, IP routes. And we added those routes earlier when we did um, just mangle rules for load balancing. So I'll just actually enable them again. All right, that's fine. I'm actually quite uh, happy. Okay, the configuration looks okay to me. So let's quickly jump into, is this working or not? I actually already see some traffic hitting the rules. So let's open up those um, servers, those dockers that we had. It looks like they've been closed. So let's just jump onto the slam PC. And then from the LAN PC, I'm just gonna do that good old YouTube trick again. So on YouTube, let's try and open a few 
songs or videos or whatever I'm, I'm just gonna turn the sound off so i don't get copyright striked again <laughs> those videos seem like they are i just want to check this last one but while that's happening i want you to take note of if we go into our interfaces we're actually seeing the triple poe and isp1 links are both receiving traffic so it is actually load balancing right now between both of the links in order to get to um, YouTube. The only issue that I have, and it's not really an issue, but again, it's Mikrotik that has a one meg limitation um, for the traffic. So I, I can't really push a lot of bandwidth. And since my Ether 3 and Ether 4 are also limited to one meg, it's really hard to sh give you or show you the full benefits because I'm, I'm capped at one meg. But it is working. We can see that traffic is being queued and it is being load balanced between both of the links and what we could do is let's just jump onto the LAN PC again I, I think I still have it open here so I'm going to close all these YouTube tabbies and then we're just going to do a ping to 8888 keep that running and then let's emulate a link failure so what we could do is we could try and um, just disable let's try and suspend that link again let's see what happens so that completely kills it let's enable that link because i think this is uh this has to do with our failover scenario from earlier so we're going to just kill ether one and see so that doesn't look like it has much of an impact either so load balancing is working but failover currently isn't and that is something we really want so let's try and fix that let's reconnect uh, i just need to connect to the rom on again because i kicked myself off come on isp1 there we go I'm connected again, so let's quickly have a look here. IP firewall. So that load balancing was working there. I do feel it has more or less something to do with my, well, the routing is fine. I mean, by default, my traffic leaves over ISP2 Let's just check what I've failed with here Oh I wonder do I have check gateway enabled on the routing let's just see ip routes uh, check gateway ping check gateway ping okay that's fine let's just do a trace route 8888 so that's definitely going over ISP1 right now. So what I think I want to do... No, but that won't work either. Let's just try and force a failover again. I 
I just wonder why is all the traffic right now on ISP one? Central IP routes. Because that doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, anyways, I am going to disable that interface quickly. So, log on to the mixture tick. Ping, 8888. It's working. So, uh, interface print interface disable. This is able zero. Let's see, can I still ping 8888? Yes, I can. Can my PCs. Okay, so that is actually getting breakout. And it is pinging out now. Huh. I think it was failing because of just that one route that I didn't have the check gateway um, configured. Let's just turn that interface back on. Interface enable zero. And if I do the ping, it is still working. If I do a trace route, it is going over ISP one again. Whereas when I just disabled the port, it was tracing over uh, ISP two, which is correct. Okay. One small variation and that caused issues. ISP one. Okay, that looks good. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing again, where I'm just going to run the ping here. And then I'm going to disable that on Eve. So let's suspend that link. I wonder if this is actually more or less something with the emulation when I suspend the link. Uh, let's just check on this Megrotech. Interface print. So it doesn't actually suspend it because it's still technically up. Okay, so I actually think I know what's going on. Okay, let's just resume the link. And that's working again. Let me delete the link. No, I'm fairly certain this has something to do with the emulation. So what I might do is I do have a couple of physical uh, Mikrotik routers uh, somewhere, like uh, one small 951 and then an even smaller, one of those little access point things um, that's a little like black AP, uh, which I got from the mum in South Africa and it was pretty cool. Um, so I'm pretty sure we could also emulate this using the physical hardware rather, because I'm fairly certain the config is correct. And if I shut the interface like on the router, it is failing over the way that I expect it to. It's just um, the virtual interface, even if I suspend the link, even if I delete this link, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, I'm deleting the link, but if I go into our router and I look at the interface, it's still seeing it as up because it is a virtual interface and i think this is where some of our problem is coming in now but if i just do the disable it works okay so i'm fairly sure that's the case but maybe hopefully that helps you bogdan and then you could do some pcc yourself um i'll add the link for either the pcc i think i'll just uh, 
add the load balancing um, article for Mikrotik uh, to this video so that people can go into that and look at the different type of load balancing you get and how it works and how you can configure it because here are setup examples for all of it and it all works totally fine all right guys i actually think i am going to end off the video here um, it's been quite a trip i enjoyed it a lot <laughs> especially the issues we had at the beginning uh, of this stream where we we're trying to import those firewalls and we had so many issues and we troubleshooted and we finally sorted everything out so guys i'd like to thank you guys for sitting through watching learning um doing i hope you enjoyed the content and i'll catch you in the next stream or video so see you guys